Would you take your Bibles with me this morning and stand as we open to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12. If you're joining with us, perhaps this is your... You're just coming in on a series of messages that we've been sharing entitled, Learning from Life Storms. Today we continue in the series as we come to its conclusion, we come to the final storm. I thought that would relieve some of you. <laughs> hey, Pastor, you've been talking about storms for five weeks. We finally come to the final one. But maybe God saved the best for last. Because this storm is called the storm of discipline. Sometimes God allows storms in our lives to discipline us. And sometimes through God's discipline, we don't perceive or understand because it's painful, but we don't understand that the purpose is to not make us feel pain, but God wants us to be profitable in what we do for the kingdom of God. And so before I begin this morning, let's just look to the Lord as we pray over this time that we have together. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to call on your name God, we thank you that through the storms, Lord, you have shared with us and you still witness to us that you're the God who is with us in life's storms. Many are the variety, God, of the storms that we face in our lives. Sometimes, Lord, that we face them in our families. Sometimes we face them, Lord, with an untimely sickness. Lord, sometimes we face storms in our finances. But God, there are other times, Lord, when we have drifted and there are other times, Lord, where we have not heeded that you will use storms, Lord, to bring us back into alignment, Lord, to your purpose, to your plan and to your will. I pray, God, today for the graciousness of the Holy Spirit to evidence the love that God has in his heart for us, that as his children, we would heed our Father's voice, listen and look for his hand and to know that he is our good, good father. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can remain standing as we read this passage of Scripture. For we begin here in verse 4. The writer says, You have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have not, and, ha and you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of the spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, verse 11, no chastening seems to be joyful at the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, everyone say afterward. <laughs> it's, not, it's not pleasant at the present. But afterward, what is it? It yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And may we say amen and amen to God's word. I needed to prompt you a little bit there at the end to say amen. You may be seated. Learning from life's storms. What valuable lessons can we learn from the storms that God allows in our lives? Remember, we said very carefully at the opening of this series, when we looked at the life of Job, if there's one person in the Bible that you want to get a class uh, education on suffering, look to, the jo look to Job's life. 
He's a man who doesn't hold back in his feelings about how he feels about suffering and how he feels towards the Lord. And yet we, we learn that through life's storms, God is working in us something of value that cannot be worked or earned any other way. And as we look at this, this final storm, this storm of discipline, we must understand that the, the writer of Hebrews has a great understanding for us. But before we, we break into this, we need to look at the background of what was just said before. How many of you know the book of Hebrews quite well that just one chapter before is chapter 11 called the Great Hall of Faith? And it's filled with many characters, many men and women of the Bible who are able to accomplish great things because of faith. And what is faith? Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things yet to be believed, right? We're seeing that in faith, it is, it is through the eye of faith and that we can obtain God's promises. The Bible says without faith, it's possible to please God. No, it doesn't say that. It says it's impossible to please God without faith. I've been challenged through a storm in my own life as recent that I was just sharing about this and my wife and I were talking about this particular storm in our life and we came to the realization that we have missed already the point of why this storm was happening in our lives. Because how many of you know that it requires faith to believe God for the impossible? It doesn't require faith to do what you can do. And so many times we fall into the trap of thinking that the situation requires us to do something. Are you hearing me? So many times, whether it's a a problem in our family, whether it's a problem in our finances, whether it's a problem that we face unexpectedly, oftentimes it's our human default to fall back to the position that what must I do? And God is saying, I'm allowing the storm in your life for the purpose that you would get your eyes off of you and put them on me. Because it doesn't require faith to do what you can do, but it requires faith to believe God to do what only He can do. And that's why the promises of God's Word is so powerful. As a matter of fact, to understand the background of the audience of which Paul is writing as the author of Hebrews that the church, in particular, these are Jewish believers who had come to faith, who had turned their back on their Jewish roots. And you know what that would cause? Much turmoil. To forsake the traditions of their fathers was to forsake their own families as many of them would experience that if they had departed from Judaism, that they were as good as dead to their mothers and fathers. They were experiencing financial pressures, as many of them couldn't find work because they had defected from the faith and had become believers in Jesus Christ. How many of you know that when you believe in Jesus, not everything is going to be easy? It's not always going to be easy. Faith doesn't make easy possible. Faith makes the impossible possible. It requires faith. And so many of them were in this battle. And look what Paul says back in verse 4. He says, in your struggle, as a matter of fact, go back to verse 3. When you're in the storm, consider this. Consider him. Who is he speaking about? Jesus Christ, who endured hostility of sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. In other words, Paul is saying, in the midst of the storms of life, if there's one person that you want to get close and personal with, it's Jesus Christ. Look what Jesus suffered, endured on your behalf. And this is why he comes to verse 4. You have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Striving against sin. Boy, when I read that passage, I'm like, Lord, there's so much room for me to grow. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't struggled to the point that I've shed my own blood. But Jesus shed his blood for us. Verse 5, he says, you've forgotten the exhortation. And what is that exhortation? 
But that exhortation is one that was given in the book of Proverbs. If you want to turn to Proverbs chapter 3, we'll read exactly the words that Paul is quoting from. You know, the very first thing that when the storms of life come, what's the first question that comes to our minds? Oh, you're a smart bunch. Why? It is such human nature for us to doubt God. As though, memo to God, do you see what's happening? Or we forget to say, and we say, God, why? As a matter of fact, I'm sure not anyone in this room, but outside of here, would even dare to say, if God was so good, if he was a God of peace, then why does he allow me to suffer as I am? If God is such a good father, such a loving father, why doesn't he come through? I, I know that this is just preaching to the choir. You would never say this to God. You would never think this way. I'm sure you've never in your years of, of walking with the Lord ever felt like there was no reason for what was happening. But we are going to quickly learn that, number one, this morning, we're going to see that God's discipline, number one, it's parental. And we pick up here in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Amens are drowning me out now. Maybe we should read that again. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Just as a father the son in whom he delights. Paul is saying to these Jewish believers, have you forgotten what God said? Paul knew that they had once known it, but they've forgotten. You see, the enemy wants to capitalize on our feelings. And as long as we are operating in the realm of our feelings, the enemy has us. Where we need to operate is not in the realm of our feelings, but in the realm called faith. Because the enemy hates faith. You see, what you may be going through may not feel good, but it doesn't change the fact that God is good. And we declare easily in, in, in the circles like this when we're at church and we're all worshiping together, He's a good, good Father. That's who you are. Until that moment, the storm blows in. You see, the enemy loves smoke screens. He loves to bring the clouds of doubt into the midst of our pain and into the midst of our problems. But thanks be to God that the Holy Spirit can bring the wind about of revival and He can blow the, the, the clouds of doubts away because when we begin to look upon the Word of God as Paul's reminding this group of believers who are going through a battle and going through the storm, don't forget what the Word of God has said to you. That's where your strength comes from. That's where your power is. Don't try to fight the enemy on your own terms and don't try to, to fake it. You will be tested and I will be tested to see God as our Father. God as a good Father, He's deeply concerned about the discipline in our lives or the lack of it, as we read here in Proverbs chapter 3. As our Heavenly Father, our Father wants to bring discipline and structure into our lives, into the lives of His children, not to cause them pain, but because God knows that it is through discipline that you and I can truly prosper and enjoy life. Let me tell you, there was a study some time ago where these psychologists thought that having boundaries would stifle the creativity of children. Can you imagine this? Probably spent our government money on this study. And so what these sociologists decided to do and these psychologists is they decided that, you know what, having gates and having uh, fences around the schoolyard was, was restricting the creativity of children. So guess what they did? They removed them. And guess what happened to the children? They didn't no longer run up and down in the fields, in the corridors around the school. 
As a matter of fact, they moved in closer to the building because no longer did they feel safe. You see, structure and discipline provides an avenue of safety for us that is not only for bad, but it is also for good. And God is a God of structure and order who has given us exceedingly good. What does the Bible say? And precious promises. Why are these promises are there? Not to, to, to cause you pain, but so that you can prosper. You can know where the limits are and where the boundaries are safe and where they are dangerous. You see, children actually thrive in structure. And when there is no structure, it's only chaos. So God, as a good father, knows what we have need of. As you look through this passage, the, these are the key words that you need to focus in on. The first word is son, and the other is children. These words are repeated six times. And in the Greek, the, the word son is not refer, referring to a young child, but rather adult children. God doesn't deal with us as little kids. He deals with us as adopted sons and daughters. That means that we have privileges as adult children. That blessed me. I don't know. I didn't bless anybody here. God doesn't look at you as, as what you are. He sees you as who you are in Christ. And in Christ, He sees you as a mature adult that has the benefits as an heir to the inheritance that adult children have the power and the authority of the Father. We get, as privileged sons and daughters, we are allowed to participate in the Lord's privileges. The word discipline here is also looking at it as we see in Romans 8.17 when you can look at our adoption. And we read that earlier. The word discipline is actually translated padilla. And it has a wider meaning than just chastening or punishment. When we think about discipline, we often think about the board of education that is applied to the seat of understanding, right? what you were disciplined as as a child, right? We think about discipline as, as the spankings that some of us got or some of us didn't get. But God's discipline is much broader than just the chastening or punishment side of it. Discipline actually carries a much broader emphasis than that. As a matter of fact, the emphasis on discipline is not so much about punishment as it is about instruction. God disciplines us because he wants to educate us. It's a matter of fact, it looks at the training in particular of children, the teaching, the preparation that they are giving for life and instruction. The main emphasis of preparation for life is only just, not only for this time, but it's also because as you look at academics, what do people ask? What is your discipline? They're not asking what is your punishment, what is your area of study? Where are you disciplined? Where have you focused your energies and attention? And God is all about educating us through discipline. The warning here, as we see in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, what does he say? My son, do not despise, verse 5, the chastening of the Lord. Do not de despise, number one, and number two, do not be discouraged. What does that mean to despise, to turn away from? There's two reactions that we can receive when we are disciplined. We can turn away from discipline, and some actually get discouraged in discipline. It's not that far that many of us can remember, even as children. Children resist discipline. Never had to teach Ethan how to say no. That was one word we as parents didn't have to teach our son. Why? Discipline is necessary. Even as people, sometimes as children we resisted discipline and those of us who resisted discipline repeatedly may even have grown into adults today who have resisted it. And sometimes this is the case because of bad experiences. Sometimes we resist discipline because our parents may have been harsh and sometimes people may have been unfair. 
But this discipline, if we don't understand its value and its necessity, that it doesn't just relate to the area of punishment, but also our preparation, our missing out on the greater value. Because when we resist God's discipline, God is saying, don't take my discipline lightly. As a matter of fact, when he's saying, don't take it lightly, don't murmur against my discipline. How many of you know there's, there's passive obedience? When we say we, we avoid the conflict because we know we'll get punished, but our heart really isn't into what we're doing. Go clean your room. And the body language is there, right? We may be actively doing something, but the heart doesn't match the discipline. We're not understanding that there's a value to, to learning responsibility as children, we have to learn these lessons when they're small because if we don't learn them when we're, they're little things, how are we going to be entrusted over here in our adult life when the responsibilities and the measure for those things become even greater? You see, God disciplines us just as a good father disciplines his children. Don't take it lightly, God is saying. Don't murmur against it. Don't complain. I like what A.W. Pink said. He said, we're better for heeding God's taps and we're less likely to receive his raps. Do you understand what a shepherd does? He carries that staff. And the shepherd calls to his sheep, the Bible says, and the sheep know his voice. And so the shepherd is able to direct the sheep with the commands that he gives. But there are some sheep, those wayward sheep, that need a gentle reminder with the rod once and then. And he comes alongside of them and he taps them where? On the soft spot, on the side, on the ribs. He taps them to let them know that they, they have wandered too far and he brings them back, right? Just to be able to receive the gentle tap. Oh, praise God for those of us who are able to heed the gentle whispers of the Spirit of God through the Word of God when He speaks to our conscience to know that we have strayed from the truth. But then there are times when the willfulness of our heart will resist the Word and we resist our conscience and we resist the gentleness of the Holy Spirit that God, we need to remember, is still holding a rod. And if he taps us and we listen, praise God. But sometimes we need the rap. And I don't know if you know this, but sometimes shepherds will even break the leg of the sheep who wanders off to teach them a lesson. Not to be harsh, but do you know what that shepherd does after he breaks that lamb's leg who wanders? He carries that sheep upon his shoulder. Because the good shepherd knows that there is something that of value that that sheep will become dependent upon the shepherd now. Whereas before, it was very much independent on its own. Praise God. Are you heeding the Spirit's taps? In some ways, God treats us like our parents. And in other ways, He does not. First, God treats us like our parents because his discipline, number one, is a proof that we are his kids. If God is disciplining you, it's because you belong to him. Amen? Did your parents discipline your friends? Probably not. The fact that they disciplined you is evidence of the fact that you belong to them. I'll never forget this growing up, that there was an opportunity where I was over a friend's house, even from church, and we went out and we decided to play manhunt. Or, and then manhunt turned to the idea, let's go and ring the neighbor's doors and run away. <laughs> this was great fun. And so we ran through the neighborhood in the nighttime, pressing the doorbells and causing terror in the neighborhood until one of the neighbors spotted us and called my friend's dad. The fun soon changed from excitement to sheer terror as my friend's father caught him and only him. The rest of us climbed a tree outside of his house and watched the punishment ensue. To our delight, we saw our friend get his punishment. 
But isn't that true? That God only punishes those that belong to him. Just like our parents didn't punish our friends. They may have wanted to. But that's the, that is the, the, the responsibility of a parent. A responsible parent will correct their children. It is not a proof of their lack of love, but rather discipline is a proof of their love. Even when you didn't like being disciplined by your parents, you received it because you belonged to them. We need to read on here in Proverbs quite a few passages of Scripture. There's a second proof. In Proverbs 13, 24, the Bible says this. God said this. And perhaps we need to bring this back into to, uh, our minds. He who spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Now, this is not a license to beat your kids. This is not to cause them sheer terror, pain, and heartache. But I call it the reset button. Just like your computer has a reset button, the rod has, has that same effect to refocus our children. I remember hearing growing up, and maybe many of you have heard this too, son, this will hurt me more than it will hurt you. And I'm thinking under my breath, yeah, right. Yeah, come on. You're just justifying what I'm about to get. A parent who loves their children doesn't take pleasure in causing their children pain. It's not an excuse to to inflict marks and bruises on them, but to let them know that there are consequences when we break God's law and His commandments that we need to know because we love them. We don't want them to continue in that way. Love goes after the lost sheep. Love pursues It forsakes the 99 and goes after the one. And because the Lord loves us, he says, do not spare the rod. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14 says, do not withhold correction from a child. For if you beat him with the rod, he will not die. But if you beat him with the rod, you deliver their soul from hell. Parents, you can write that down. That's Proverbs 23, 13. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and the rebuke gives wisdom. But a child that is left to themselves brings shame to their mother. Let's look on in our text. Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 8. God is educating you. That is why, this is from the message version. He says, that's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as his dear children. Listen. Listen. Trouble, the trouble you're in isn't punishment, it's training. The normal experience of children, only irresponsible parents leave children to fend for themselves. Would you prefer an irresponsible God? Looking at Job real quick, in Job chapter 5, Job also says this, Job 5 and verse 17, he says, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. Verse 18, I love what this says. Though he bruises, he binds up. Though he wounds, his hands will make whole. There is no distinction here. There is no no contradiction here in God's love or in his discipline, which brings me to my second point. Not only is God's discipline parental, but number two, God's discipline is always perfect. Look at with me at verses 9 through 11. We respected our own parents for training and not spoiling us, so why not embrace God's training so that you can truly live? While we were children, our parents did what was, seemed best to them, but God is doing what is best for us. Training us to live God's holy best. Praise God. God's discipline. Someone once said that when God disciplined, He speaks through your conscience. But if you won't listen, God uses people 
But if still you won't listen, he uses the circumstances in our lives and usually the unpleasant ones to get our attention. You see, God's discipline is different than our parents because God's discipline, number one, is perfect. It's always for our good. Say that, always for our good. Another way of saying that is God's discipline is for your advantage, that you might learn and be educated for your good. God is not disciplining us because he enjoys causing us pain or causing us grief. God's discipline always has a purpose. There are three purposes for God's discipline. The first purpose is that discipline will teach us right from wrong. Amen? How will a young man cleanse his way? But by taking heed thereto according to your word. Well, how do you know God's word is true if he doesn't discipline and correct us? A good father disciplines his child so that they can know right from wrong. And the purpose of that discipline is to help us avoid sin. Did not God give a command to the first man and woman in the garden way back in the beginning? You can eat of all the trees. Enjoy the fruits. Enjoy this paradise. But there's one that you must not partake in. Was God doing that because he was being harsh? Did God want to withhold something from them? That's what the enemy used as a deception. God knows that if you partake of that fruit, the moment that you do it, you're going to be like God. And do you know the only way that deception worked in that reality that they would be like God? They had the knowledge of good. What did they gain? Simply the knowledge of evil. Because God said, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And he, he wasn't just referring to physical death, but spiritual death. Sin always comes in. When, 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 and the, 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 the consequence of that sin is death. And God looks at this discipline. And, and the second area in which God's discipline has a purpose is that this. What does it say down here? In verse 10, for if indeed for a few days they chastened us as seemed best to them, but he does it for our profit. What, what profit is there in receiving discipline from the Lord? The greatest profit that we can receive is that God knows that our discipline will help us be more like him. Be ye holy, God says, for I am holy. Number three, all true children of God will receive God's discipline. If we do not, what does he say in verse 8? We are not legitimate children. We're not his. God's discipline is not contradictory to his love. As a matter of fact, verse 8 says, For if you do without chastening, we have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. But verse 9 says, We have had human fathers who corrected us, and we respected them for it. Should we not respect more the Father of lights and live? How much more should we respect our Heavenly Father? And you see here, this respect is the, is the same respect that I've learned that I enjoy with my own son. The same daddy who plays with him, the same daddy who rides bikes with him, tickled him, bought him ice cream, is the same daddy that has to paddle his bottom when he does wrong. It's not a contradiction of daddy's love. It's the same daddy. It's the same love. God's love, however, is a perfect love. His discipline is perfect because God's discipline is not a reaction to, the, to the, the headache that we're causing him as many times our parents may have disciplined us out of anger. I'm guilty of that. I can't discipline perfectly. Neither can you. That's why God says we should never be what? In a position that we judge one another. Doesn't it say that in the Bible? Judge not lest you be judged. Judgment is not our place. As a matter of fact, there was the, the, the religious people, they got that woman that was caught in adultery. And how did Jesus handle the situation? You, without sin, throw the first stone. You can't do it. Why? Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God's discipline is different than human discipline. God's discipline has the goal in mind is that God wants to make us more like himself. 
Which brings me to my third and final point. God's discipline is always profitable. On this condition, verse 11, if we embrace it. We have to embrace God's discipline for it to have an effect in us. Verse 11 says, afterward it yields, what? The peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. James 3, verses 17 through 18 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and there it is, peaceable. Aren't you thankful that you can know what God's will is for our lives, that it is peaceable? Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And it goes on to say in James 3, 18, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I came across this quote and I'm like, wow, this speaks volumes to me. And I pray that today God would catch us if we have resisted God's discipline, that we would rethink about this, that he is who he says he is. He is a good father and he loves us. But I have found this to be true in my experience and this is something I had found. When people are right with God, truly right with him, They are hard on themselves. They judge themselves. And they're easy on other people. But when people are not right with God, they are easy on themselves and they are hard on people. I want that one to set in. When people are not right with God, they're easy on themselves and they're hard on others. I just talked about that with judgment. Which brings me to the question and conclusion here today is to take an inventory of our lives and to ask one simple question. One question that can make all the difference in our lives is how spiritually disciplined are we? 1 Timothy 4.8 says, Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having a promise of life that now is and that which is to come. Some of you are really disciplined with your diet and we applaud you. Some of us are not. Some of us are disciplined in the area of sports and you're athletic and we applaud you. Some of you are not. Some of you are disciplined in the area of study and you're scholarly and you're able to teach others. And some of us are some of us are well disciplined in our area of our profession, in our jobs. We devote ourselves to so much of our lives, to our work, and some of us are not. You see, as you take an inventory in our lives, there are areas in our lives where we are well disciplined. But let's talk for a moment on the area of spirituality. How disciplined are we in the area of our spirit and our discipline? Because the Bible talks about disciplines that we need to take into consideration if we are to grow and mature and experience the peaceable fruits of righteousness and to study to show ourselves approved of God. Do you agree with me that it takes discipline to read this word? Does it take discipline to pray? Sure it does. Daily? It takes discipline to come to church on Sunday, doesn't it? Amen? We're doing pretty good. It takes discipline to give in the offering, doesn't it? Wow, I'm surprised at those amens. It takes discipline to have personal devotions every morning, doesn't it? It takes discipline to come out to a prayer meeting. You see where this is going. It takes discipline to sign up and be a part of a life group. It takes discipline to come with your children to Sunday school. Whoa, we're going down. It takes discipline to come to church on time. You see, 
What I just did was compare and contrast to the areas in our lives where we are disciplined. Praise God. But let that discipline come over into the areas of where there is true profitableness. It's in the area of our spirituality. That's what Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 8 just said. For bodily exercise profits a little. It's good to take care of this temple. But if that's all the discipline that you have, guess what? The Bible says, what did Jesus say to the rich young ruler? You could gain the whole world and still lose your soul. You can be disciplined in your business and be successful and find success there. But the the reality of the gospel is this. There's only one area that's going to carry you throughout eternity. And that is your soul. We need to hear carefully that God will discipline us, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. What does it say? At the present, this discipline isn't much fun. It feels like it's going against the grain, but later it pays off handsomely. For those who are well-trained find themselves mature in their relationship with God. God is so patient with me. Amen. He is so patient with me. And I know he's patient with you. Pastor Solomon shared about that last week when he looked at the life of Jonah God was so patient with Jonah and his discipline with with Jonah, how Jonah had prejudice in his heart and in his mind, and he didn't want to go and do what God called him to do, to preach out to the Ninevites. He didn't want them to repent. He didn't want God to show mercy upon their enemies. But God had a way of disciplining Jonah, didn't he? Jonah didn't listen to 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 the taps of the Spirit speaking to him. Jonah bought a one-way ticket away from God. And what did David say? Even if I make my bed in the depth of hell, behold, you are there. We cannot run away from our Father. He's everywhere. And yet, in His goodness, He is there because He wants to discipline us because He loves us. And He wants our lives to prosper. So if we would want to prosper and live a spiritual disciplined life, then we need to embrace God's discipline. And should we not just accept blessings from His hands and not also expect that there will be storms in life? It's interesting that we will say that God is prospering us when things go well, and we don't think that we're prospering as much when things are not. But I've come to learn through these lessons in life storms is that much more is gained going through the storm than avoiding them. And with God, all things are possible. The next storm that you go through, I want you to look at your situation as an opportunity, an opportunity in which God can prove his love for you because he is a good good father and perhaps today this is not the story of your life maybe this is something that God meant for you to carry to share to someone else who is in that storm God disciplines us because he loves us to every son he loves he disciplines do you belong to God would you bow with me this morning Holy Spirit, you've been speaking these weeks about how we are to navigate through these storms. Not that you're the author of every storm, but you allow them to come nevertheless. Lord, there are opportunities for you to demonstrate your love. I pray God today as we would take this opportunity to look at our own hearts. How spiritually disciplined am I? I devote so much of time. Maybe I devote my time to my talents. Maybe I devote my time to my family. Maybe I devote my time to my work. 
Now, how much do I devote to spiritual disciplines? Lord, there's room for our growth. There is room for us, Lord, today to heed the, the gentle taps of your word, of the conscience, of the Holy Spirit knocking at the door of our hearts. May we heed the gentle whispers of the Spirit that would speak to us. That with a simple word, he could break a bone. But in the stillness and in the quietness, Lord, that we would hear with clarity and heed your voice and be still and know that you are God even in the storm. God, today I pray that you have spoken, Lord, of the necessity of embracing discipline in our lives. Discipline is not to make us experience pain. Discipline is to help us prosper. Discipline is to help us become more educated with what you want to accomplish in and through our lives. You're a good father. That's who you are. You sent your son Jesus to die the death that I deserve. Lord, I haven't resisted to the point of shedding my blood, but Jesus did that for me. And Jesus is the one in whom he gives me victory today. Father, I thank you for the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the hope of heaven. I thank you, Lord, for the completion of your love that it never, never fails, God. Up until the final moments of our lives, God, you are pursuing us through the ages. And I pray that, God, that we would learn this even at this point in our lives, that we would say yes to your will, that we would say yes to your way, Father, that we would say yes to your discipline. I accept it, Lord. I would receive it. Calls us to grow by it, Lord, that we can become mature, that, God, that we would become profitable, that we would become useful in your hands. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us one more time. Next week, we're going to look at the prodigal king. The prodigal king. His name was Manasseh. Manasseh. What an interesting character. If you've never studied him in the Bible, I encourage you to look to 2 Kings chapter 22 and then 1 Chronicles chapter 33. <coughs> We're going to look at the prodigal king and we're going to see how great is God's love and how great is God's grace for us. God truly loves us. That's why he disciplines us. Remember the next time you sing, he's a good, good father. That's who you are. Remember, if you're his kid, he'll discipline you. He'll correct you. But it's because he loves you and he wants to keep you in that path that you are to go the path that leads to everlasting life. Thank God that he loves us. Amen.